is my body, which is for you. Do this as a memorial of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this as a memorial of me. Therefore, every time we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we are proclaiming his death until he comes. This, my brothers and sisters, is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. With you. This is a reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And now the Son of Man must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so that everyone who believes in him may have everlasting life. For God loved the world so much that he sent his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost, but may have everlasting life. For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world might be saved. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, the first reading uh, this morning from the book of Exodus is a reading that's very characteristic of what the ancient Hebrew people used to do when they had something to say to God. And it really didn't make much difference what it was that the ancient Hebrew people wanted to say to God, whether it was, my God, my God, you have given me everything, and I give all back to you. Or, why did you do this to me? My friends and family are suffering. Or, thank you so much for this gift. Or, I am so sad. Or, I am so joyful. It didn't make really much difference what it was that they had to say. The first reading from Exodus is what they did when they wanted to share themselves and talk to God and pray. The Hebrew people, as you know, were a wandering people, and Abraham came out of what is generally now known as Baghdad, and he had flocks of sheep. He was a shepherd, and the Hebrew people were shepherd people they found their way from Baghdad through Syria, down through Lebanon, into the Promised Land, obviously from the will of God, because God called Abraham, but also because the sheep grazed their way to the Promised Land. And so, what would happen as the Hebrew people developed their speaking and talking to God was that they would bring something valuable to themselves to somebody like me, a priest. And over the years, what characteristically the Hebrew people brought to somebody like me was a little lamb. 
and what the way they worshipped and how they worshipped went something like this. The priest would go to the people and receive their gift. He would come out to them and they would bring this little lamb and he'd take it from the people and he'd bring it up to something like what we have here, an altar. The priest would come to the altar with the little lamb and hold it up to Yahweh their God in offering. All the people who came would gather around the altar and they'd watch the priest do this. They'd watch the priest take their little lamb, bring it to the altar, and raise it in offering to Yahweh. And in their hearts, gathered around the altar, they would say, Yahweh my God, do you see that little lamb? I knew that little lamb since it was that big. I've raised it. Yahweh, will you see that lamb as me? All of my needs and my hopes and my desires and my sorrows and my joys and my loves, see that lamb as me. The priest then holding the lamb up, would lower the lamb down on the altar. He would draw out a knife, and he would kill the lamb. And the life breath in the little lamb would go out of it. Mm. and the lamb would lie limp on the altar. All of the people gathered would watch the priest do this. They'd watch the priest lower the lamb, draw out a knife, kill the lamb, and see the last breath go out of that little lamb. And as that would happen, they would turn to Yahweh their God in their hearts and say, Yahweh, do you see that? Do you see that? My God, that's how deeply I want to come to you. That's how deeply I want to come to you with my last breath. Ah, oh, my God sees how deeply. He saw how deeply I wanted to come with my last breath. Ah, oh, that feels good. And so then very often, they would share the lamb then in a feast and seal that sense deep within their hearts that, ah, yes, my God has seen how deeply I want to come to him through that little lamb, He's seen from the last breath. And so they would feast and have a banquet 
with the Lamb and receive of the Lamb. And then they would go home, re go into their day feeling, ah, God sees me. God knows my needs and my hopes and my sorrows and my loves. Ah, I've prayed. I've prayed. God sees me. Feel good. I feel good. And they prayed. That was it. That's how they did it. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew how people prayed. And more importantly, Jesus knew how people felt good about praying. Jesus knew just how it was that people left church feeling, ah, good. Jesus knew that and said, I, Jesus, I, Jesus, will be your lamb. I, Jesus, will be your lamb. And you will never need another lamb again, ever. I will be your lamb. And so Jesus allowed himself to be stretched out on the altar of the cross. And on Calvary, in the very same way, the last breath in Jesus' body went out of his body, the last gasp of his breath <clears throat> went out of his body on Calvary in the same way for one simple reason, for one simple reason. So in 15 minutes from now, in the Eucharistic prayer, he will be present here on our altar. For one reason, that he will be present here, and after the gospel words of Jesus, the priest will say and hold the body and blood of the Lord and say, Father, we, your people, recall the death of your son, his glorious resurrection, and his ascension to your right hand. And we here, ready to greet him when he comes again, we offer you now in thanksgiving, now this holy, and now this living sacrifice. For we pray through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father. And so all of us here stand under not a lamb, but the lamb of God among us. The lamb of God present here among us. And in the same old way, but now in the new way, the priest holds the body and blood of the Lord among ourselves up the new lamb. And all of us underneath the new lamb in the same old way, but in the new way, can turn to our God and say, God of glory, do you see your son's presence here among us? Do you see him lifted high over the altar, our new lamb? Hear my prayer, see my need, see my joy, hear my thanks because of his presence here. And we all turn to God. And the Lord, of course, allows himself to be presented by all of us to God the Father. That's what he has come to do. At his last supper, he said, I will not leave you orphans. I pray for you. And this is how he does it. He gathers us all like this and allows himself to be presented by all of us. And then while held high among us, he prays for all of us and gathers us together and presents us to his father as a gift and says, Father, have you met Karen here? Karen needs prayers for her mother. I'd like you to hear her prayer. Father, uh, you meet Eric here. I'd like to introduce you to Eric. He and his wife have just lost a baby. 
and I'd like you to meet, meet him and his wife. And the Lord allows himself to be here to pray for us. And with him held high, we are given to God the Father here as gift. I'm sure you've had this experience, I have. People come up to me and they say, will you remember me in prayer? And I say, and they walk off saying, mm, feeling real good. I'm sure that's happened to you. That's nothing, that's nothing compared to what we're meant to leave this church with in a half an hour, with a sense that, you know what? Jesus Christ himself took my need, took my struggle with so-and-so, and presented me and that as a gift. Jesus Christ prayed for me. We are meant to leave here in a half an hour with a sense I'm still not sure about this. I'm not sure about that. But you know what? Jesus Christ prayed for me. He took me, and he took my need, and he asked God the Father to bless me. <sighs> yeah. That is the peace of the poor. And that is how we find ourselves so often mesmerized and drawn around this table. So let's pause for a moment and ask for this gift for ourselves and for so many who do not know that they have this place to go with who they are and do not know that they have the Lord here to plead for them.
see this bread and this wine as us. As we say, Father, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Father, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. And so, my brothers and sisters, pray with me that this offering of ourselves may be acceptable to God the Father Almighty. Father, what is the basic structure of the Eucharistic prayer? Marvin, when we refer to the Eucharistic prayer, what we're generally talking about is uh, that part of the Eucharist that begins with the preface, then is followed by the Holy Holy, uh, then comes the invocation of the Holy Spirit for consecration, then the institution narrative, followed by the Eucharistic acclamation and the anamnesis, then the invocation of the Holy Spirit for union, then the intercessions, and then uh, the doxology. Now, I know that that's, uh, you know, a, a lot of highfalutin lingo uh, for, uh, but anybody who goes to Sunday Mass would easily recognize this. Uh, for instance, the preface, which begins, the Lord be with you and also with you, lift up your hearts, and then the priest proclaims the saving presence of God in human history, of course, and then the whole congregation responds in the words of Isaiah chapter 6, holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, etc. cetera. Uh, this is then followed by the invocation of the Holy Spirit for consecration, which is a big term for the calling down of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts of this bread and this wine, that the body and blood of the Lord be present here among us. That, of course, is followed by the institution narrative, which is the gospel words of Jesus as, as we have them at his Last Supper. Then, of course, after that, the whole congregation proclaims the Paschal mystery that we celebrate in the Eucharistic acclamation. Uh, then follows uh, the offering prayer, uh, the anamnesis, the remembering of the passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord, and then the offering of the body and blood of Christ, the bread and wine, uh, as the Eucharistic prayer one uh, speaks, the bread and wine offered by Melchizedek, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the, uh, that offering prayer right after the, uh, uh, the, the institution narrative is extremely, extremely important. Uh, the anaphora aspect, anaphora is the Greek word for uh, offering, which the whole Eucharistic prayer is. Uh, the anamnesis then, the remembering of the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ, is then followed uh, by the calling down of the Holy Spirit for union, uh, that through the body and blood of Christ, all of us may be uh, uh, one, uh, eating of the one loaf, etc. cetera. And uh, this is followed by the general intercessions that are for the, the whole church, uh, the pope, our bishops, the clergy, uh, for our families, uh, for the dead. And this is followed by the doxology, which is the Greek word for the giving of glory, the through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, forever and ever, amen. And so that's really what we mean by uh, uh, the Eucharistic prayer when, we, uh, when we're talking about that. What... Uh, what are the origins of the Eucharistic prayers? Okay. Because there are more than one that we use in the church. Th that's right. Uh, in, uh, in the English-speaking uh, situation that we find ourselves in, we have uh, nine Eucharistic prayers uh, that are uh, available to us for Sunday liturgy. Uh, we have uh, two Eucharistic prayers for Masses of Reconciliation, we have three Eucharistic prayers uh, for children, Masses with children, and we have four Eucharistic prayers for general purposes, and they're obviously uh, very simply noted, Eucharistic prayer one, two, three, and four. And 
it's Eucharistic prayer one, two, three, and four that uh, we'd like to situate on and talk about and uh, uh, in this presentation, in part two here. And I think to, to talk about that, um, I suppose we can take it from the top. If we take Eucharistic prayer one, uh, we come to you, Father. Uh, it begins there. Uh, Eucharistic prayer one is the Roman canon, and it has very interesting history. Just uh, to be brief, um, its origins are probably from Pope Damasus I, uh, around 380 A.D. And what that means is that Pope Damasus was in Rome, but uh, years, a few years before, as we know, Constantine moved the capital from Rome to what we know as Istanbul, uh, Constantinople, of course, on uh, Byzantine shores. And of course, Constantine moved there because uh, there was wealthier, there were more trade routes, there, were, there was more politics going on. Well, when he moved out and took all the Greek liturgies with him, uh, the Romans needed a Eucharistic prayer for their own. And so what they said is, well, we're not going to have all these Greek prayers. We want one in the vernacular. So they, uh, Pope Damasus, uh, looks as though, commissioned this writing of this Eucharistic prayer. He also commissioned uh, St. Jerome uh, in Bethlehem to translate the Vulgate into Latin, of course, which was the common language then. Mm -hmm. um, but the first Eucharistic prayer uh, is called the Roman Canon because it was, uh, it was for Rome, of course. But it, interestingly enough, the word canon is the Greek word for measuring rod. You know, like uh, a builder's level that has a mm -hmm. little bubble in it, and you put it here to see if this is level or, or if the, the wall is straight, you know? Right. And the bubble says, yes, it's straight. Well, the Greek word for that measuring rod is canon. And so what happened was is that they called this the Roman canon, which meant this Eucharistic prayer was to be the measuring rod for all Eucharistic prayer worship throughout the Roman church. And obviously, it sort of was because we used that Eucharistic prayer principally all the way down to the Second Vatican Council in 1964, which simply translated that Eucharistic prayer into English, which is the first Eucharistic prayer that we have. Now, the second Eucharistic prayer, Lord, you are holy indeed, the fountain of all holiness. This is the very brief Eucharistic prayer. Uh, that has a very interesting origin. Uh, that has come to us from the Egyptian Christian community of Alexandria, which is the port town of Cairo in Egypt. And of course, after Christ died, uh, there were Christian communities that obviously sprung up in Jerusalem, obviously one sprung up in Antioch, up in Syria, then one sprung up down in Alexandria in Egypt, and then of course Rome, and then of course Constantinople. Well, the Eucharist Eucharistic prayer too is more or less 1,800 years old. Uh, from the Egyptian Christian community in Alexandria, although it comes to us through a Roman priest named Hippolytus. So it's commonly called the Eucharistic prayer of Hippolytus. However, he got it from the uh, Alexandrian community in Egypt. So the third Eucharistic prayer now, which is, uh, Lord, you are holy indeed, the f uh, and all creation rightly gives you praise. The third Eucharistic prayer comes to us from the Second Vatican Council. After 1964, the, doctrine, uh, the document on the liturgy and the commission established uh, took Eucharistic Prayer Three and wrote it to highlight the basic structure of the Eucharistic prayer using very, various Greek anaphoras. But, um, so Eucharistic Prayer Three is right along the line of the basic structure of the Eucharistic prayer that we talked about. Mm -hmm. Now, Eucharistic prayer four. Uh, Lord, we acknowledge your greatness. All your actions show your wisdom and love. That's how that begins. Uh, that comes from the Syrian port town of Antioch, which that community expressed 
the way they said mass in Jerusalem, really. The, the Jerusalem community had influence in, in Antioch. And this Eucharistic prayer also is at least 1,600 years old and comes from what's called, uh, the work called the Apostolic Constitutions, that this, uh, this uh, Christian community in Antioch uh, collaborated and wrote down all the apostolic uh, material, how they said mass and how they uh, did baptisms and various heresies and uh, moral norms, et cetera, et cetera, kind of a compendium of how they lived. Mm -hmm. And this Eucharistic prayer four was in, in that compendium. So when we're looking at it, we have four Eucharistic prayers, really. We have a Roman one from around 1,600 years old, years ago. We have an Egyptian one from around 1,800 years old. That's Eucharistic prayer two. Mm -hmm. Eucharistic prayer three is from the Second Vatican Council. And Eucharistic prayer four is from Antioch in Syria. So it's a, it's a rather colorful history. And, uh, you know, as we're sitting at the liturgy, it's, it's nice to know the his historical roots that, that we really have. Right. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to Father, all powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the true and eternal priest who established this unending sacrifice. He offered himself as a spotless lamb for our deliverance and taught us to make this offering in his memory. As we eat his body which he gave us, we grow in strength and love. As we drink his blood which he poured out for us, we are washed clean. Now, with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, we sing the unending hymn of your praise.